Welcome back and many thanks for staying with us right here in Morning at NTV. Close to 30 people have been hacked to death within the Greater Masaka Sub region. The president contends that the Allied Democratic Forces have been rearing their very ugly hates within this jurisdiction. We had anticipated to have Honorable Okello Oriem Henry to have uh, him in the studio to expand more on this conversation, but then at the last moment he said he might not be able to make it in that regard. But that doesn't stop us from talking to Major General Mogeshe Moon too. Yes, the Coordinator Alliance for National Transformation is going to be engaging Stephen Mbide on what he thinks is the deeper root of the troubles within the Massacre Greater Region. A very good morning, Stephen Mbide. How is the Major General doing this very beautiful morning? Stephen Mbide, you are live on Morning at NTV. How is Major General Mogisha Muntu doing this beautiful fine Wednesday morning? Yes, good morning to Ro Romeo Busiko. Good morning to you. This is, yes, on Fefe Sue Chibuga, coming to you from Entebbe Road, uh, just at the home of retired Major General Grigori Mugisha Montu. And he is, of course, doesn't need much more introduction. Uh, we know him having been the pack bearer for the Alliance for National Transformation. He just concluded uh, presidential elections, oh, uh, 2021 presidential elections. But also, he helped found this party. He's a senior. Uh, politician, but also at one time commanded our forces, the UPDF. But we want to understand from him, using his experience uh, on the issues, wide range of issues, but especially talking matter security, because now there is a big security question, especially in the Masaka sub-region. What's happening there? What is behind all this? Different uh, people are coming up with different versions. Some people are saying those who are terrorists and they, those who are arrested in that whatever's happening there will be charged with terrorism. The president is also coming out on record saying that uh, these are being funded or being supported by some politicians who are confusing them. But let me also engage with the Major General, Grigori Mugisha Moon, to help me understand what's happening in Masaka. Good morning to you, General. Good morning. And when you look at the situation in Masaka, Rengo, Kalungu, Bukoma, Simbi, Sembabuli, yeah. uh, this is not the first time, yeah. but we see now over 28 people, 26 people are on record for have been killed, others are having injuries. Yeah. What comes into your mind? What is happening in that region, Masaka? Well, it's unfortunate that so many people have been lost in a span of about two, three months. Our condolences go to those who have lost uh, their loved ones. Again, as you've indicated, it's not the first time. It's another spike. The killings seem to be random. Looks like the purpose could be to spread fear. Whatever the intentions, because we, some of us who are not in the security services don't know the intentions yet. But uh, in the short term, I suspect that uh, now that uh, the security services are going to put their focus on that area, I suspect what has happened in the past will happen again. Mm. That because of the concentration of attention and resources, that this spike will be stamped out. But then unfortunately that will again be temporary. We have not yet seen focus of resources on the departments of police, which ordinarily should have the capacity on a nationwide scale to cut out uh, investigations, first to cut out uh, preventive measures, but also when incidents happen to cut out investigation and cut out uh, a successful prosecution so that the culprits who engage in these kind of acts know for sure that there is no way you'll commit any crime and not be detected, not be investigated, prosecuted, found guilty, sentenced, and pay a heavy price for whatever crime you commit. I think that's where the largest uh, weakness is. Yes, the state security apparatus can uh, uh, marshal resources immediately to respond to a situation like now they are responding, and like they have responded in the past. The weakness, we wonder, I can't even understand why this regime never pays attention to that. Until they complete the circuit in terms of the law and order sector, where they invest heavily in uh, the CID department of uh, police, invest heavily in the prosecution's department, 
invest heavily in the uh, in the courts so that you have a, a, a long-term solution to crime. Because even if you stamp out this uh, spike, which I believe uh, will be stamped out even this time round, one, you may be able to get the culprits. Two, you may uh, clamp down, maybe even get people who are not necessarily involved, but the carp is out of fear because of concentration of uh, resources in this particular given time. They can go underground mm. and then wait for another period. And then they come up again. Because the biggest uh, problem that we've seen in all these uh, roundups that have happened in many parts of the country where these crimes come up, even when they get uh, people whom they say are the suspects, you never see the end result of it being successful prosecutions. And it's, it's a weakness, you know, and, mm. and, and uh, the government may say whatever they want to say, but most times you never, uh, you never, you can never make a conclusion about the intentions of any government, depending on what the government says. Whenever you want to know how serious the government looks at any sector, you just look at the budget. You, so you feel, get a sense of feeling that uh, maybe the budget, the budget will do much more in terms of logistics? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, when you look at like, like the CID budget, CID is underfunded, CID is understaffed, they are ill-motivated, and there is no way a force like that can ever cut out uh, effective investigations that can lead but to effective uh, prosecutions. Could this have a connection with the way we see, the pace at which we see uh, them moving into the ground? Because some people have argued that if it was maybe political threat, yes, the president says, blames it to politicians, but some people are saying if it was, you know, Misha Montu or, or uh, uh, kind of SJ or Bobby Wine staging a political rally in Masaka or wherever, you would see a lot of armored brigade and oh policemen yeah. <laughs> go on the ground. But now yeah. you see isolated incidents. I, you know, uh, again, now that there is a spike, of course, it's drawing attention. The whole country is focused on Masaka and the government, of course, is feeling pressure. And therefore, they have now to concentrate resources in Masaka. But in the event that either they arrest the uh, carpets, or the culprits themselves go underground, the spike will level out. Hmm. And then, what I suspect might happen, the government will again go to sleep in regard to that sector. We will all understand that it has woken up when we see the money they pump into CID. And, and, and in terms of uh, uh, capacity to investigate. And, and of course, it's, uh, it, it needs to be comprehensive in terms of uh, morale of the, of the first, right from the time of recruitment. Uh, CID is a department that needs to have the best, even the police services. And then uh, remuneration. And then motivation. Also training equipment of all the requirements for investigating crimes uh, sufficiently and of course supervision and once the department is sorted out of, of CID is, is uh, well equipped, well motivated, well staffed, then you also have to work on prosecutions as I've indicated and then the courts because even if you have a good investigation, if there is no good prosecution, the culprit will walk away. Yeah. If you have uh, good investigation and good prosecution, but then you have weakness in the courts, again, the culprit can walk away. So yeah. you must complete mm. that. The, the people of Masaka, yes. Rengo, Kanungu, Bukoma, Singh, are seeking yes. answers. When you give such, they look at it as operation or even uh, air-conditioned offices talk. Yes. For them, they are waiting now. They've lost they their loved security. ones. They want security. Yes. They, yes. Want their, they want their loved ones back. Yes. Government yes. is saying that you can give each family 10 million shillings. How do you look at this? <laughs> you know, the, this regime is good at uh, knee-jerk reaction mm. and also uh, making, uh, you know, band-aid responses to situations. Because are they going to be giving uh, that kind of money to every Ugandan who gets killed in the first place? Because if they are going to do that, then that means maybe it becomes policy. Would they have money to keep giving that kind of money to all the people who get uh, killed, who get murdered? 
So how different is it now from the people who are being uh, murdered in uh, massacre, from those who get murdered in different parts of the country? Wh where is the difference? Because all of them are supposed to be secured. So that, that's just simply, I don't know whether it's politics, I don't know whether uh, a way of uh, um, diverting the pressure, which it certainly would be onto them, that so many people, maybe 26, 27, 8, have died in a span of three months. The best thing would be for them to re redirect resources within the police force, also put more resources into police force, but focus it on the CID department. The, of course, the other department, the, the, the anti-terrorism unit as well, so that they are sufficiently funded, well equipped, well staffed, well motivated. The other problem is the issue of morale. I just uh, had uh, the speech of... Uh, 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 General Seven, read by uh, General Kahindo Tafiri at the bury of uh, the late uh, uh, General, Poke General Poke. Lokech. You know, trashing the police. Because <laughs> if, 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 if that speech was from him, which was read by General Tafiri, it basically it, it was saying that uh, uh, the late General Lokech was literally acting in a manner of putting things together within the police forces and making it seem that now, with his departure, unless another individual like him is put there, that the police force is almost non-functional. Because he was talking about, for example, interpretation of information from the uh, camera networks, saying that the police were playing uh, cards until uh, General Ketch uh, went there. And basically saying that the police force well, is he has not... Well, he has so when you say that publicly, you are literally undermining a whole police force of 42,000 uh, uh, police officers. So if, if the police itself, in spite of all the weakness they might have, if there is no attention, to put resources, also to direct resources in the departments like CID, like uh, and terrorism unit, and also give them morale, you know, understand that the, uh, the government understands their situation, and, and, and because motivating uh, people, the army has got many officers and men who are motivated, who fight for the country. They are Ugandans, they are recruited from the society, as police are recruited from the same society. So the basically it is a question of what attention you pay. You know, so if you go in public and literally indicate as if the police is just uh, not doing anything mm. other than an well, individual. Well, on, on one hand, you accuse it, them it, of being... It, 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 basically, that's what I read, in the, that's why I mm. had the speech live. I mean, you know, in one, on one hand, you would so. accuse the police of being infiltrated by Kawukumi, the Bin Weavers, but then, then you, you also... On streamlining it. He also uh, tell you that he, the police yes. uh, is accusing them of being human rights violators. But when you look at it uh, from the other side, he will come back to you, the politicians, one of them, though he doesn't mention which politicians, he's accusing them of being behind uh, the killings in Massacre that they he's are. Just, he's just scapegoating. He's just scapegoating. I don't think that they even have understand the, 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 the reasons. Because these, the reasons for these kinds of uh, youth, maybe who are involved in that, one, there is an environment in which there is uh, joblessness, there is a state of uh, frustration in the whole uh, country, Th there is a problem within uh, the economy, basically because of uh, COVID. Now the concentration will be on resolving those root causes of what can cause crime, not just scapegoating. But that's their character, that's what they normally do. And uh, until there is a new regime, I highly doubt whether they'll be able to concentrate in offering uh, long-term solutions to some of these issues. Yes, I know they have the capability to focus resources immediately, as they are doing now, and they can stamp out this kind of spike. But it will keep on recurring in quite a number of areas in the country. Let me pick your mind on some other issues. Uh, we know we, South Sudan is our big, one of our biggest export markets, but when you see the situation happening there, it's known that one would w wish to have. Uh, our traders heading to South Sudan, they are now, many of them are even the truck drivers are now staging a peaceful demonstration. They are saying the situation in South Sudan has to be resolved peacefully, and then they are, the business operations continue. Uh, South Sudan, even the political leaders, some, some time back they had the, the warring situation factions were fighting. How can the situation in South Sudan be handled so that trade and politics get, get along on the same line? My hope is that, I, I don't know what's happening in, uh, in Kenya, 
Because Kenya and Uganda are critical in regard to South Sudan. I believe that if the leaders in both in Kenya and uh, Uganda pay attention and exert pressure consistently for quite a while, that the uh, Sudanese leadership would start paying attention to this situation. Because uh, the traders from, I believe it must affect on, not only Ugandans, but also the Kenyans. Because like the truck drivers, I believe that they are not uh, only Ugandans, that they must also Maybe be Kenyans. some Kenyans have been killed. So the, the vulnerability of the people at that level, the biggest problem is that if it was politicians, for example, if you had members of parliament, if you have ministers who went to South Sudan, they were harassed, I can tell that the uh, governments would exert pressure. Mm. But that uh, maybe, again, when there's a spike and uh, it is contained in a short time, then government just uh, cease to pay attention. But the problem in South Sudan is a problem of attitude. So the two governments should uh, sit with the leaders in South Sudan and make it clear to them that if they don't change their ways, if they don't instill into the South Sudanese, the security services, the leaders in government, that they must pay attention to the neighbors who go there, and there must be security for them, that if they don't do that, that there'll be a price to pay, then South Sudan will pay more attention. Because literally, Uganda and Kenya are the lifeline of South Sudan. So Uganda and Kenya have got leverage in that regard. If they choose to use that, they can uh, uh, read the right act to them. Because they need to know that if the uh, routes through Kenya, through Uganda, are closed, like now, if there is a, a, a strike by the drivers, how will they get uh, you know, the means of livelihood? How will they get in uh, imports? How the, they export. The Kenyans you are talking about uh, in just less than a year, they expected to go to the polls. Uh, but when you look at the situation, the, it's not that ham harmonious between the politi amongst the politician, top politicians there. And when you see, tw when you look at 20, 2007, the way it ended, it was into turmoil. We've just gone through an election. You, yeah. using your experience here, what would you tell them as they prepare for the next generation? Because even the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeal, trashed constitutional amendments. Yeah, the Kenyan situation seems to be quite uh, tricky. They have had two experiences in the past, where they really were at the edge, almost of uh, tipping over. One hopes that they have learned from those two experiences. Then one hopes that they will engage each other. And, and ensure that they put in place the ne necessary mechanisms to go through this next transition. It, it looks quite uh, uh, tricky, but they have got the experiences, and uh, uh, one really hopes that they learn lessons from, from that. The two times uh, that they went through those uh, ugly situations, they recovered very, very fast. So at least uh, we can give that to them. And uh, to a large extent, it has started moving on the right track. They seem to be uh, in, a, in, a, in a situation of uncertainty right now. But knowing how they relate, the Kenyan politicians uh, many times tend to be different from, for example, here in Uganda. Even when they are involved in, a, in a, uh, intense conflicts, they are able to meet behind the scenes mm -hmm. and discuss and negotiate. So one hopes that they'll be able to do that and ensure that they take care of the future of the Kenyan uh, nation, the Kenyan people. When you, when you get back home here, you are an educationist also, uh, having background of a uh, key, key background in the education sector. Uh, Kenyans and Tanzanians are back to school, but here we're still under lockdown in, in schools. Uh, the thinking should be now, you cannot keep the children out of school for good. Uh, what should be the thinking now in your perspective? There, were, there's, there was a Zoom meeting, I think, uh, last week. The Minister of Education engaged with stakeholders. That's a, you know, a positive it step was on forward. Monday. Mm. Monday. Mm. I don't know the outcomes of it, but it should be co they should uh, persist in that, continue discussing until they reach a consensus and reopen schools. I mean, Uganda is not an island. They should also study lessons. I, 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 sus I, I suspect they may be doing that. If they haven't, they need to find out how is Kenya, you know, uh, opening schools. And, and Tanzania and, and look at whether there is any negative impact. I have not heard of any, not in Kenya. 
So they can learn lessons, not only here in the region, all over, all over the world. There are many countries that have gone through the same experiences, who've opened schools. They should open their minds and do that. Because the reason they are giving that they will only have to vaccinate first before they open schools, that's going to take a long time. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know whether the government has given a time time timelines as to when they think they will have finished the vaccination. I would think that they would be uh, telling us a lie if they would be able to vaccinate the whole country in under six months. Mm -hmm. Most likely it will take even more than a year to be able to marshal the resources, g even get the vaccines, and be able to uh, vaccinate on a countrywide basis. Talking because, you see, they say that uh, many schools are day schools. And the fear is that if they go to school and go back home, that they be infected at school, and then they can take the the, um, the virus virus uh, home. But you see, even when they stay at home, the virus themselves are in the public. They're in markets. They're in in the public uh, transport systems. So once they get infected, they also get go and infect the the, the students at home. So it doesn't make sense. Hmm. Let me also uh, get speak about politics, uh, Alliance for National Transformation, which you founded as the as lead, leader then, uh, before you ceded power to Ali Salah, Honorable Ali Salah, so as the national coordinator now. Are you frustrated that now you didn't even get a single MP into the political fray? No, we are not frustrated at all, because we operate from the end state. Mm. We are a very driven organization. We have the right message. We have got uh, very good organizational capabilities. We know for sure, come rain or shine, that at some point we'll take power in this country. So we concentrate on that so much than what is happening in the current time. Mm. So we are preparing ourselves in the event that we take power, because to us it is not just a question of taking power, it's how you use it. Otherwise you'll just end up in the same vicious cycle. Because in a group, the, the group which is in power now, I think the ninth, so in a group which takes after, after Genome 7 is going to be, I think, the 10. So our concentration is how we keep organizing ourselves. We would have wanted to go to parliament. We are not able to, but that has not diverted our attention from the things that we've been doing since our inception. We are now working on our organizational capabilities. Mm. So whether we're in parliament or not in parliament, that's not the issue. In the organization, do you see Mugisha Moto on the ballot 2026 again? Well, that's the 2026, uh, we will keep building our capability. That's the most important thing. As I've said before, we want to build an organization whose capability is such that anybody we put at the head of it, anybody who would be running the country, has got uh, robust capability from the organization. Because any one single individual, however good he or she is, cannot transform this country. And yet that is our focus, how to transform this country. When so our, our focus is going to remain on how to build our capabilities. And we are doing quite well in that, even during the COVID time. We've been doing a number of things. Even, even as I speak, there are activities we are going to engage in. Seven yeah. months after the elections that we had in January, on, on the 14th of January, how do you look at the opposition uh, now? The other day I saw the leader of opposition trying to bring together political leaders. The Speaker of Parliament is also trying to see in Parliament that there is a talk about Uganda's future. How do you look at the general uh, playing field of the opposition, but vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the, the way government or NRM is playing its own cards? We, we went through an election which was manipulated. We have ended up where we are at. What we have to do as uh, uh, the opposition is to be that that would want to see happen. As, 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 as uh, Gandhi said, that be the change that you want to see happen. That's the most critical thing. Because as, as, as we normally say in uh, Alliance for National Transformation, you can't give what you don't have. So ch change is inevitable in terms of physical change. What is not inevitable is qualitative change. And yet that's what is desired in this country. And that's what we have to work at as the opposition to ensure that we break this vicious cycle. That the next round of leadership, the group which goes into, is prepared to break this country of the vicious cycle of injustices, of unfairness, of inequality before the law, of unequal uh, development in different parts of the country, in, in the, in, in to ensure that there is creation of jobs, to ensure that there is a sustained uh, economic growth and development that is able to lift the whole population out of uh, the poverty levels in which uh, many find themselves in. That can't happen by accident. It must come out of uh, 
focused, consistent actions on behalf on, on the part of those who would be in, in power. And we have to prepare for that. It just can't happen. Mm. Yeah. And that's okay. what we concentrate on in ANT. Thank you so much. Your last word to the viewers on whichever uh, subject you want to pick yourself on. Is, uh, many people seem to be uh, frustrated when you listen to radios, you look in the news, uh, you know, media, social media. Really, we should not be frustrated as a people. We must know that there is no country which has reached where they have reached, which those the countries that uh, many Ugandans would want to go to for green pastures. That was not transformed by the population in those countries themselves. There is no transformation that we can be carried out from outside of any society. So the responsibility is ours to transform ourselves. So rather than being frustrated, we should understand that we're in a situation which can change and work on it consciously, ourselves. Because we have got the richness that uh, we have as a country. The, the part of most Africa. Well Thank endowed, you. Mm -hmm. One of the most well-endowed countries in, the, in this planet. God must look at us from the heavens and, and shake his head. <laughs> <laughs> Thank look you. Look at so the much. country as beautiful as this is, and then we become the black part of Africa. In the situation which we find ourselves, we must uh, you know, get ourselves out of this by ourselves. And therefore, nobody should get frustrated. Nobody should lose hope. Because we have got the God-given capabilities to change our situation. Thank you so much. We had Major General Grigori Mgisha Muntu, of course, also for welcoming us into your beautiful home here along Entebbe Road. This is Stephen Imbido on Fepe Suechibuga now handing you back to Romeo Busiko, who is there in the studios. Thank you, Rova, for me, my brother. Well, thank you very much, Stephen Imbido, for that.